Welcome back to Pentagram Prime, everyone. Picking up on the latter part of exercise seven, we are tasked with finding the singular points and associated residues in the complex plane for one over z cubed minus three. In order to find the singular points, we begin by factoring the cubic polynomial in the denominator. It is important to not mistake this for a third order pole at z equals the cube root of three. The actual result is much more, shall we say, nuanced. If we convert the three on the right into the cube of the cubed root of three, then we can apply the difference of cubes identity. From here, the second order term can be broken down with quadratic formula. While the formulas are breaking down the aforementioned quadratic, I wanted to mention that the term z naught has multiple values for the purposes of this problem, and which value is being used at any given time will usually depend upon what point in the video you are watching. Two of those values are currently being displayed. If you have any questions that do not involve NFTs or dating websites, then ask me in the comments. At this point, it is clear that f of z has three distinct singular points in the complex plane. One is located on the positive real axes, while the other two have both real and imaginary components. Each singular point forms a first order pole at its location. In order to make these latter two points easier to visualize, we will factor out their magnitudes. Since the only difference in the value of these points is a minus sign on the imaginary component, their magnitudes are the same. Calculation of the magnitude in question is easier to follow if we start by crunching the square of the magnitude, which is the sum of the squares of the terms. Manipulating the exponents in each term allows us to factor out an exponent of 3, and before you know it, the 4 drops out and we're left with the square of 3 to the 1 third, or absolute value of z naught equals the cube root of 3 for both complex points. This also happens to be the magnitude of the singular point at z naught equals the cube root of 3. Factoring out the magnitude from these points and simplifying all of the exponents of 3, as well as the fractions in those exponents, gives us cube root 3 times a unit vector equal to minus 1 half plus or minus i root 3 over 2. These vectors should be familiar to anyone who has been around some 30, 60, 90 triangles. Plotting these points on the complex plane shows us their respective phase angles. With both their magnitude and respective phase angles in hand, as well as an appreciation for what these individual trig values mean, we can represent the singular points using Euler's relation. Using this notation to describe the singular point on the real axis is, in this case, a little redundant, but I thought it best to be complete. This notation will become important later on. Also, if you plug f of z into Wolfram Alpha's residue calculator, you will see that the singular points, along with the residues that we'll soon see, are represented a little differently than the way that we have described them so far. Still, the singular point on the positive real axes should be easy enough to make sense of. The two complex points, however, are represented in a different manner. If you're interested in playing around with De Morf's formula and the roots of complex numbers, then you will see that the singular points for f of z calculated by Wolfram Alpha match the ones that we just derived. For z naught equals negative 1 to the 2 thirds times cube root 3, the expression has three separate values corresponding to k equals 0, 1, and 2. Upon using Euler's rule to convert the principal root back into trigonometric form, we see that Wolfram Alpha uses it as a way of expressing the singular point located in the second quadrant. For z naught equals minus the cube root of negative 3, we must separate 3 from negative 1 inside of the radical before analyzing the cube root separately. We also need to convert the negative 1 into exponential form. Converting the other negative 1 into exponential form and factoring out a 3 on top and bottom allows us to combine its exponent with that of the cube root of negative 1 so that we have a single phase angle inside of the exponent. Combining like terms gives us a simplified representation of z naught for all three values of k. Focusing on the principal root and using Euler's relation to convert the exponential back into trigonometric form, we see that Wolfram Alpha uses the principal root as a way of expressing the singular point located in the third quadrant. 
Part of the reason that I'm taking the time to show you this is in order to send home the point that simply copying figures that you get off of an online calculator and submitting them as your own may not be the wisest course of action for a homework assignment. Tools such as Wolfram Alpha are excellent for checking your work, but ultimately you need to be able to properly interpret the results. For now, we will continue to use A plus IB notation as we calculate the residues at our singular points. We will do this via Proposition 4.1.2 on page 244. It is described in Episode 60, link in the description, so we will refrain from repeating the description here. Prop 412 requires that we separate f of z into g of z in the numerator and h of z in the denominator before calculating the first derivative of h of z. In order to simplify things, we will calculate h prime of z using the original form of f of z, and this gives us a derivative equal to 3z squared. For the rest of the video, I will be keeping a graph in the upper right hand corner of the screen. In case you lose track of which singular point we are working on, the point in question will be circled there. For the residue at z0 equals the cube root of 3, located on the positive real axes, we see that the requirements for g of z0 in the numerator, h of z0 in the denominator, and h prime of z0 all check out in accordance with Prop 412. The formula for the residue listed in Prop 412 yields 3 to the negative 5 thirds, and while that doesn't exactly match what Wolfram Alpha came up with, a little bit of algebra and the answer will buff out just fine. Moving on to the second quadrant, we see that for the residue at z0 equals cube root of 3 times minus half plus i root 3 over 2, we again evaluate g, h, and h prime at z0, and the algebra gets a little thicker than that of the previous singular point. Luckily, the calculation of g of z0 is rather trivial and aligns with the Prop 412 requirements. As for h of z0, the trick here, as is so often the case, will be to religiously check your work. You'll want to be sure not to lose track of any imaginary factors as you are cubing the binomial in question and to keep a close eye on any resulting minus signs. Do that and you'll find that h of z0 equals 0 and is thus in accordance with the requirements of Proposition 412. H prime of z0 isn't as difficult to bust out as that of h of z0 since we're only dealing with a second order polynomial versus a third. Still, be careful with your powers of i and your minus signs. Do so and you should arrive at the conclusion that h prime of z0 is non-zero and thus meets the last of the Proposition 412 requirements for this point. With the requirements for g, h, and h prime having been met, we are clear to evaluate the residue utilizing g of z0 divided by h prime of z0. g of z0 is simple, h prime of z0 is comparatively complex, both literally and metaphorically, and we need to move the complex expression to the numerator. Upon multiplying top and bottom by the complex conjugate of the denominator, we get an answer that separates neatly into real and imaginary components. Our answer lies in the second quadrant, same as z0, as does the answer provided by the Wolfram Alpha Residue Calculator. Wolfram's answer is, however, expressed in a different fashion. But, with a little bit of algebra and careful root taking, the website's answer winds up with ours quite nicely. Just be aware that a single number in the complex plane can have multiple roots depending upon the exponent being applied. The residue value shown on Wolfram Alpha appears only to represent the principal root for the exponent in question. Finally, for the residue at z0 equals cube root of 3 times minus half minus i root 3 over 2, we do the same thing that we just did, only there is a minus sign in front of the i this time, which places us in the third quadrant. We begin by evaluating g of z0, which, since g of z is 1 for all values of z, meets the Proposition 412 requirements. The calculation of h of z0 once again forces us to exhibit religious devotion to things like factors of i and all minus signs. Remain faithful, and you'll find that h of z0 equals 0, and thus is in accordance with the requirements of Prop 412. Calculation of h prime of z0, though not as cumbersome as the cubic polynomial that we just dealt with, must still be handled with care. 
drink enough coffee, and you will find that h prime of z naught is non-zero, and thus meets the last of the Proposition 412 requirements. With all of the requirements for Proposition 412 having been met, we can use g of z naught divided by h prime of z naught to obtain the residue. As with the previous singular point, we need to multiply both top and bottom by the appropriate complex conjugate in order to separate the residue into real and imaginary components. Our answer this time lies in the third quadrant, same as z naught, as does the answer provided by Wolfram Alpha's residue calculator. Wolfram's answer, once again, is expressed in a different fashion, making use of the principal root of a given complex number, and needs to be refined a little in order to line up with the answer that we got using Proposition 412. So there you have it. Exercise 7c looks simple on its face, but it's not. Online tools like the Residue Calculator can help, but I would never dream of pulling numbers off of Wolfram Alpha and then writing them down as my own if I didn't know how to simplify them into real and imaginary terms. It's also important to note that the things that can really jam you up on a problem like this aren't so much the application of techniques in Marsden and Hoffman, but all of the tools you were probably shown in high school that now must be executed with deadly precision in order to make sure you get an answer that makes any sense. These include methods for factoring cubic polynomials, as well as what it means to take the nth root of a complex number. Just a couple of things I should mention before I bounce out of here. First of all, I messed up the last two videos. Sorta. I got the right answer for both episode 62 and episode 63, but I could have used a simpler technique and I didn't. I blame it on tunnel vision and time crunch. Anyway. I pinned comments to both episodes, and the aforementioned simpler technique can be found in episode 60. If anyone has any questions, you know where to find me. Finally, a bit of good news. You may have noticed gaming content in some of my earlier episodes on this channel. I've left them in place because I hate deleting videos. But I stopped posting such videos because they don't mix with the math-oriented content that makes up the majority of my catalog. I still like to game, however, Kerbal Space Program specifically, I may eventually diversify into Minecraft, and I needed a place to put all of that good stuff, so I created Pentagram Pwned. It's a home for everything that I can't post here. Pentagram Pwned currently has one lonely video, but I guarantee that will change. You won't hear my voice as much on Pentagram Pwned because this channel already wears out both my voice and my patience for video editing, but if you like music and gaming content, that's where it's at. I might even try to demonstrate my fascination sometime with Arduino boards, model rockets, and mouse traps, if I can ever find time for them in my schedule. Till next time, this is Pentagram Prime signing off.